episode number nine. Any of the social platforms today, regardless of which one you choose, can be harnessed in massive ways to create and drive more sales for your business. It's just a matter of where you put your focus. Welcome to the Be Real Show with Travis Tutal and Huff, where we talk about solutions, tips, and tricks for social marketers and businesses. Boom shakalaka, and welcome to the Be Real Show. This is Travis Tutal and Huff, and I am fired up today to bring you our featured guest, Kim Garst. Kim, are you ready to be real? I am ready. Let's do this. Kim is the co-founder and CEO of Boom Social Media Marketing, a leading digital marketing firm, and she is also the author of the best-selling book, Will the Real You Please Stand Up, Show Up, Be Authentic, and Prosper in Social Media. Kim is also a public speaker and with frequent appearances on television, radio, and in front of live, large audiences. Kim, we've given the listeners just a little insight about you, but tell us more. Well, uh, do you want to know something that most people don't know about me? I would love to. Okay, I usually start with that. Um, I love to play hockey. I'm not good, but I love to play hockey, and most people don't know that. (laughs) It's a little uh, a little different than the social media um, side of my of me that most people know. uh, But I absolutely do love the sport, like to play. um, But like I say, I'm not a powerhouse player, but love the sport. And how long have you been playing hockey for? Uh, well, my, uh, oh, goodness, I'm going to date myself again. My, both my boys play. And nice. I, um, like my youngest is 20, and he started when he barely turned five. So a couple of years after that, some of us moms decided that we were going to learn how to play hockey. And, um, and I, yeah, I've been playing uh, off and on since then. So, wow. you know, roughly 13 years or so. That is fabulous. What a cool story. And and so how often, like on a weekly basis, would you play or do you guys have a certain amount of times you guys have scheduled per month or how do you guys fit into your schedule? Well, uh, when I was living in Tennessee, there was actually a ladies league there and I played, uh, you know, pretty consistently. There isn't, unfortunately, a ladies league here in Florida or one that's uh, you know close enough to drive to. So I, I play pretty infrequently now uh, when my boys come home, um, you know, for the weekend or whatever. Sometimes we'll go to stick and puck and you know just you know mess around (laughs) they think it's pretty cool frankly that their mom plays hockey absolutely (laughs) absolutely and that's just just leads to the whole boom factor of uh getting to know you and we really appreciate that honest real uh moment that you're sharing with us here so now we're going to start um with a be real story tell us a time that maybe you failed at social marketing um we all are you know have success right out of the bat and tell us time where maybe you failed well um actually i have a really good story as it relates to this it was a really bad uh experience but it it ended up being um Um, an amazing experience in the sense that it was a life lesson and a social media lesson simultaneously. Um, But essentially what happened is I had, um, I had set up a a training event. It was a webinar based training event and it was a paid event. So people had to pay for, uh, you know, to attend this, this live webinar. Um, And um, we had some, we were using a Google plus hangout and we'd had some technical issues um, but we didn't ha- realize how deep the technical issues were. So we went through the entire training, uh, which was almost two hours. And I got off of the training and, and went to Twitter. And there was all of these her- awful comments about, you know, you I, we weren't listening. There were all these tech issues. You know, nobody could hear. You know, it was just, just a horrible um, a thing. You just, you got to the point. You just want, it's one of those things where you just want to pull the covers up over your head and say, ah, oh no, you know, but um, we just kind of went to general quarters and we're like, okay, how can we fix this? You know, one of the things that I have always said is that people don't mind near as much if you, when you screw up as if you don't fix it. Um, 
so, you know, we re redid the, the videos. We added value. Um, you know, we immediately emailed everybody and apologized and said, you know, give us a chance to fix this. Um, did the same on Twitter, you know, owned it, basically. You know, it was our mistake. So sorry. You know, I hope you'll give us a chance to fix it. Um, ultimately, it we turned it totally around. We ended up having to give one refund out of, you know, like 320 people. People. Wow. Um, so it ended up being okay, but it was a, you know, it's just one of those moments when things go wrong in your business. And, you know, sometimes things go wrong and they're not public facing, you know, and you, nobody really knows, you know, what happens, but sometimes they play out on social media, which is exactly wow. what happened to us. And, um, and, and it was a bad experience, but one that we were able to turn around simply because we owned it. I said, yes, it was a problem and, you know, uh, fixed it, essentially. I love that when you say own it, because at the end of the day, if you make a mistake or something that goes wrong, if you own it and you take that time like you guys did to go back and reach out to everyone on Twitter, reach out to the emails and then add value, you you get what you have where you had a, a really a success turn from a failure. And the biggest thing that can happen with social, I think, is if you do have a business failure, it allows for that transparency for you to make the change and save yourself a lot of headaches later on, maybe because you listened. Well, you know, I, I'm always telling people, too, that there are way more lurkers than there are engagers on social media. Sure. And people are paying attention to how you handle things. You know, that's just that goes from you know straight up uh, normal conversations that you're ho holding with other people. And it also goes uh, and it also speaks to things that aren't uh, as, you know, things that you might not want people to know. So how right. you handle those things transparently and openly instead of deleting them or, you know, taking them to on Twitter to a DM, for example, um, is uh, is again, it's a it's a representation of of, uh, of, of being real and owning uh, both the positives and the negatives that happen in your business because there's not a business out there that doesn't have some something that doesn't that doesn't go wrong at some point in time. I mean, you know, it, it happens to all of us. So if you can just, um, you know, transparently handle, handle those things, not only are you handling them with the person that it involved, but you're also showcasing to a community of people that are watching that you, you know, you're an honest business person. And yes, something went wrong, but you fixed it. And, um, you know, that, that I think that's incredibly valuable. Absolutely. And it goes back to Kim's book about authenticity and that, it, authentically pe things are going to go wrong and that's going to happen and you know what authentically you can help be listen and be there for them so that you can honestly give a great relationship instead of it just being something where you feel like you're blasting people messages now on social it's really a human to human relationship and when things go wrong it allows you to really answer them pretty fast. And um, so now take us, Kim, to at that moment, take us to a real moment where you feel like social marketing changed your mindset forever for business. Well, I was actually one of those people uh, way back in the day who said I would never have a Facebook account. Yes, I was because <laughs> I kind of likened it initially to kind of the MySpace crowd. You know, I've been online for uh, 24 years dating myself, had an online business for 24 years. So, um you know, was it was one of those things that I, I was afraid when it first started, uh, kind of you know invading normal conversation. When it, well, current conversations, scratch that n normal term, uh, <laughs> but co in, in, into, into conversations, I was like, ah, oh, you know, I'm not sure. I don't think I'll ever have a Facebook account. Um, but you know, to go back to my roots, when I got first got on social media or when I first got um, online, I was leveraging you know B two B board and, um, you know, AOL business chat rooms to connect and engage with people. So yeah. when I got on social media and Facebook specifically, because that's where I started, which is where most of us, I think, start, um, then I was like, it was just like a huge uh, light bulb went on for me because I was able to see the power of the connections. Uh, and it, it kind of, I kind of related it back to, you know, how I started was literally just, you know, reaching out to people that owned businesses inside of, you know, BB um, environments or AOL chat rooms, <laughs> literally dating myself. Um, oh, yeah, me too. Like, I love it. Yeah, I 
that's how I connected initially. It's all about that personal connection, right? I mean, at at the end of the day, social does allow us to, you know, reach out to an abundance of folks. But it's really about the fact that, like you mentioned with your AOL days, and I remember the days of logging on on AOL, where you could connect to a community. And it's the same thing. It's, It's people sometimes forget how really how personal it needs to be, right? Absolutely. And, you know, just as a comparison, those AOL chat rooms back in the day are, you know, very similar to Facebook groups today, you know, where there's a community of people who share a common interest and, you know, you have an opportunity to, you know, engage with those people. So once I saw that and I saw the, um, you know, kind of the the opportunity, except it was much more connected and um, and, and it let, it was a, an a ultimately the biggest uh, you know kind of draw for me was the fact that you could put out information you could share things on social media and attract the right people to you instead of having to go after those right. relationships you know lots of times and this is so true in social today is what you put out is what attracts the right people to you um uh, you know, a lot of times people will say, well, you know, don't, why do you share X, Y, Z, you know? Um, and I personally think just that human to human marketing element, just being relatable to people, again, will attract, uh, you know, the right people to your business versus the wrong people to your business. So what you put out there each and every day has the opportunity to create future sales for you. And, you know, a lot of people miss that point, I think. Absolutely. And they also kind of miss the point you just said about future sales, because a lot of times people think, oh, where's the ROI on this campaign today? And they don't think, realize that the social media, uh, social media postings, the social media content you're posting today has a drip effect for years. And people will go back to your first blog. They'll go back to your first podcast if they like the 50th podcast. And they'll listen to every single piece of content going back years within all the content you've created. And I'm sure you've experienced that yourself where, you know, people are, you know, responding to stuff that maybe was, was posted, you know, a long time ago, but all this content that you've put, put out now makes them finally go, Hey, you know what? I need to take this seriously and give them a call. Absolutely. It's, Again, you know, it's about sharing uh, content or, or, you know, I I use content, um, you know, as an overarching term because, you know, whether that's blog content or whether that's a Facebook post or a Twitter, uh, a tweet on Twitter or, you know, an Instagram post or whatever it is, it's all content. Anything that you share that's public facing is it has an opportunity to create a future sell for you. Um, You know, I'm a huge believer that, you know, people are not on social media necessarily out the gate to buy our products and services you know they're there they have their own agenda so how do you uh how do you become top and um top of mind for that person when they need your product or service and in my opinion it's about creating relatable content you know people uh, a way that people can relate and feel like they know you and ultimately when they need your product or service you will be the one that comes to mind and they'll of course buy from you um I, I, again, that's the way, you know, <clears throat> the way people buy has totally shifted. It's not the way it used to be. You know, even 10 years ago, 15 years ago online, you could put up a, a website and be selling a widget and people would buy. They don't do that so much anymore. You know, it's a, it's a, a word of mouth uh, environment. People are constantly uh, looking and people are much savvier today than they have ever been before. So, you know, whether they, you know, research you on social media or whether they, you know, use the Google machine, you know, whatever it is, most people don't just uh, arbitrarily, um, you know, just randomly find a website and buy from that particular website. Um, it's usually a process. So true. So true. And it's all all about what you said about creating that relatable content to your audience. And it's not about selling. That will take care of itself. It's really about creating that content and building that value to their lives, helping them in a true, authentic way. And and then ultimately, and, and, and taking it almost to that next level, like you have with almost reaching out to them to be helpful and, and where you're helping people. Um, it's just, it's the most amazing thing about social networking. So now we're going to about to enter your mind and with some B-realisms, these are some short question and answers. And uh, I'm really excited to get your feedback. So tell us in one word, how will we describe Kim Garst? 
Oh, goodness. Um, well, I hope that the uh, the way that I would hope that people see me is um, helpful. <laughs> you know, awesome. I would love to be the person that says, you know, or that, you know, if, if I was to hear somebody say uh, something specific about me is that I, you know, help them in some way that I had added value to their life, you know, whether that's uh, to their business or to them uh, personally. Um, either way, I'd like that to be kind of my um mantra, I guess, is that I, you know, that I actually added value to somebody else's life. I love that, Kim. It's all about being helpful. It's all about giving back before you're asking to, for, you know, for some something and really doing favors, or if you want to call it, or, or helping others connect others um, without the expectation, you know, or something's going to come back to me. And when you do that, like you have, you just build such a wonderful network of followers, but also that they really care because you've authentically been there giving them great content for years and you haven't been, you know, there just pushing sales messages for them. Yeah, exactly. It's, uh, it's really, you know, I, I say this all the time, lead with value without the expectation of, re- of reward. Um, obviously, the reward comes by virtue of the fact that you lead and you're more concerned about the ba- value that you deliver than you are about what you're going to get in return from it. Uh, so it's kind of a byproduct of just being, you know, sincerely um, interested in and delivering uh, great value and serving your ideal client or your ideal prospect. And that being, you know, heartfelt, you know, that's your goal. That's that, that's your overarching go- goal each and every day is how do I serve my audience or my community? I love that when you said heartfelt because so many people think sales first and it really needs to be compelling content first and sales will come from that, no doubt. Absolutely. So now tell us, what do you think is next for social? Well, you know, it's I, everybody asks this, uh, you know, is what's coming, what's coming? You know, I don't know that social will always be called social media. You know, will it shift? Will it, you know, change? Um, you know, as social has evolved, I think from a business standpoint, um, I am seeing a lot of shift back to basic business principles now. You know, <clears throat> social has been out there long enough that it's matured in the sense that, you know, most people, not that everybody knows how to use it, uh, yet. I'm not saying that, but it's definitely got a user base that's pretty savvy now. You know, they're, you know, they know how to post on Facebook, they know how to tweet, that kind of stuff. I think now I'm seeing a huge shift into, um, you know, the ROI space instead of, um, when I say ROI, I mean, you know, that's always been a conversation. Everybody's like, well, what's the ROI of social media? Uh, and I love, I think it's uh, Gary Vaynerchuk is, is always saying, well, what's the ROI of your mama? <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah, it's a relationship. How are you going to, how, how do you clarify the value to of a relationship? Absolutely. But I think uh, with that said, that's a huge piece of social media is building out that community and being value based to that community. Um, but I think even beyond that, I'm seeing a lot of um, shift to the social selling space where, you know, uh, getting back to core business basics and the the uh, you know things like you know the cost of a customer acquisition and you know uh, doing very specific things that are campaign driven that can uh, showcase a very specific ROI as it relates to social media and I'm seeing more of that than just you know literally throwing stuff at the wall and hoping st- something sticks um, which you know it's kind of bizarre because with social media it's the only marketing method that I've ever seen that people approach it with no plan Plan. Right. I don't understand yeah, that, but people, it's true. <laughs> they're like r- running and gunning, and it's like you know, let's let's stop here. And before we need to be on Snapchat, yeah. you know, um, let's talk about you know why we need to be on Facebook or LinkedIn or the value of you know really thinking about the the different networks as far as the time it's going to take, but also that you know maybe there's an audience there, but maybe they don't really care about you, you know. And so why do you need to spread yourself thin and be on a million different networks? when you really need to be on one network authentically and good, and it would pay off tremendously. I am a a firm believer in what you just said. Um, You know, if you have limited time and resources, you know, find uh, a platform that your ideal client is there and just, you know, dig in, figure it out, learn it, you know, start to use it. I think that any, any of the social platforms today, regardless of which one you choose, can be harnessed in massive ways uh, to create, um, you know, and drive more sales for your business. It's just a matter of 
where you put your focus and, um, you know, what strategies you're going to put into place to actually create those sales. So true. So true. Now, in the perfect day, how do you typically like to start your day? Well, I usually start my day um, with what I call quiet time, uh, you know, doing some reading. Um, you know, I I try to do that each and every morning just to give myself that, um, you know, that kind of edge. Uh, because if I don't do it first thing in the morning, I, I literally don't do it. So yeah. I try to do what I call kind of like, I guess you could say it's personal development, uh, literally each and every morning. Um, you know, I read a variety of things. Uh, I'm an I'm an avid reader. Um, so that's kind of how I start my day. I love it. I love it. And I've actually found that having that quiet time just gets you ready for the rest of the day. You know, all the different fires you're going to fight, you know, emails, maybe new customers, all the different things you got going on. But if you give yourself that little quiet time in the morning, even if it's just 30 minutes or an hour of reading or meditating or blogging or doing something for you, it just uh, makes you feel like from the from the start, you like, yes, I got something done. I'm productive today here. Yeah, exactly. So and, you know, so many times we get so wrapped up in you know, the work side of things that we don't take that personal time for ourselves. So, you know, if you if you can kind of set that aside, that set that time aside first thing, then you don't, you know, um, you know, put your own self on the back burner, I guess. Right. No, absolutely. We, you know, you, like I said, we get caught like in this firefight where you have all these things going on and new clients and possible people want to take, you know, interview time or maybe someone wants to meet or maybe, you know, there's something going on with the client and you have to fight that fire. And it's like, you know, the, with that quiet time, um, first thing in the morning without checking emails or having the TV on or anything like that, I found it's just this great momentum gets built. And, um, and like you said, it's that personal development. So tell us what, um, what is some of the best advice you've ever received uh, fail faster I think is the best nice. advice that I've ever received you know sometimes we get so hung up on um, the failures that we experience in business and frankly we all have them uh, I, I tell people I think I fail each and every day in some ways you know uh, one way or the other you know something didn't work exactly like I thought it would or you know I have to tweak it or you know sometimes they're just out and out failures um, but you don't, you learn from those things. And, uh, I think they're more valuable. The failures that we have in our businesses are more valuable to us than the successes we have. Um, because we build on, I think, in my opinion, we build, um, on those failures more than we build on the successes because successes don't ever get analyzed really. Um, you know, oh, wow, that worked, you know, and you move on. Um, right. the failures are the ones we kind of dwell on and you're like, okay, well, um, you know, <laughs> you, you, you kind of, and they they drag us down. So right. figure out what, you know, why they failed and, you know, learn from them. And then, you know, don't, do you either tweak it or you just don't do it again? Exactly. And it's the best part about failure. Like you mentioned, fail fast is it, Hey, you can learn from it and you can tweak it and you can make it better or you can just not do it at all. And then if you, the faster you learn that, the less, you know, time and investment you've put towards something. And I think that's one of the best advice that I've honestly heard because it's so real. It's just, Hey, so many people in marketing, especially social marketing, they're afraid to do a campaign or do a tweet because they're afraid what it's going to, you know, what, what's going to happen. It's like, you know, we'll fail, fail and then see what happens. And, you know, all Ultimately, at the end of the day, there's really, you know, no no wrong lesson. You just learn from it. Yeah, I, I personally think that the the failures are again much more valuable base to us than you know the successes. So true. So now we're going to enter the hot seat. This is our final section, and we're going to be talking about where you share some phenomenal resources and just give us some real talk answers. So be real, Kim. In the perfect world, if you could meet someone right now for lunch, who would it be? Okay, are they in this world still, or are they out of this way. world? Either way, yeah, either way, <laughs> okay. either way. Well, I think uh, if it was out of this world, then I, I would love to, um, it, you know, have a, a lunch with uh, with Jesus. That would be my out Absolutely. of this world answer. Um, in this world, um, I, I would have to say probably maybe Richard Branson. I would just love an opportunity to, you know, kind of pick his brain um, because, you know, he has had a lot of successes and failures, I think, as well and obviously tons of success but I, I i would love to know you know just you know kind of the back end story of some of his failures right you see the front yeah. side of it the successes but you know what did he learn from those failures and you know how did they you know how did he turn them into a success i, I think that would be an amazing conversation 
and he is pushing the limits on every level of his life, which is so inspiring to, to see someone live by. And like you mentioned, there's been lots of failures, but the success always outweighs the failure. Yes. And yeah, you, you just said something that I thought think is um, amazing, you know, from the context of us as business owners, you know, sometimes we are so focused in on, you know, our business and other people's businesses as we're, you know, watching competitors or, you know, um, you know, if we're uh, connected to other business owners, you know, that we mastermind with or whatever, you know, we tend to focus on that business aspect instead of, you know, kind of tuning into the personal side of things, you know, taking care of our health. Um, you know, that's a huge problem for business owners today, in my opinion. So the personal successes and the failures that we have, I think are just as important, frankly, to us as business owners as, um, as anything else. And you're right, Richard um, does absolutely embrace all of that. He is a, you know, he, I, I have heard him speak on a, a variety of things, uh, some of which is, is absolutely not directly related to his business. And I'm hoping one day to go to space with Virgin Galactic. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, definitely. So tell us, do you have a favorite internet tool or resource that you like to use on a daily basis? Well, I'm like, I'm a huge believer that um, the work is in the tools, <laughs> you know, so I have a lot of them. But I guess if I had to say that there's just one um, that I, you know, use each and every day and that I would... Uh, um, think would save them anybody listening a ton of time it would probably be canva.com and i create a lot of visual content um for social media so i i use canva um each and every day and you know it's a quick and easy solution for those who don't have a lot of design skills you know uh, you know if they don't know photoshop it's okay you know you can go and create amazing visual content using um, the canva platform I absolutely love Canva too. And I've, I've been inspired for years from seeing and our team seeing your social media visuals, which were amazing. And we were like, how is she doing this? And, and then, you know, Canva kind of came into play and what Guy Kawasaki is doing with Canva, I think is even taking it to that next level where you're really seeing some awesome, really uh, awesome templates and, and very helpful ways for people to create um, very uh, nice, visually appealing social media graphics quickly. Quickly. You know, that's the thing, um, you know, I do have a design background and I'm very proficient with Photoshop. And until Canva came along, that's what I used. But Canva has shaved a ton of time um, off of, you know, the, the time that we would spend creating graphics. We also use it as a collaborative tool. You know, now my team will create things and, and say, you know, Cam, go take a look. And literally I can go, and, you know, makes a few tweaks if I choose to and approve things and, you know, let them know that they're good to go. So it's it's a great resource. Um, obviously, you can't do that if you're, you know, using um, a Photoshop or some other tool um, because, it, you know, you'd have to physically be standing over their shoulder to do that. Absolutely. And a lot of it's just, it's become such a collaborative network. Like you mentioned, I, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that because that was even something I was going to say is how do you collab using their tool? And that's just a great example that, you know, you have your team working on stuff and you can come in look at it, make some tweaks and it's all in real time. Absolutely. Which is really neat. neat. Um, and again, it will, if you, if you have a team that is, you know, still, using Photoshop and, and some of the other design tools, um, I challenge you to, to move them over to Canva because it's going to shave a lot of time off of their work. Absolutely. And another cool one that I've seen is uh, called Word Swag mm -hmm. for your phone. Yeah. That's a, that's a fun one just if for, for kind of if you're on your mobile and you want to just create a quick visual, mostly probably for your personal networks or something like that. But uh, just another really cool one to create like kind of on the go, you know, and I hope Canva comes up with an app similar to that because I think that would be really helpful. Well, Canva is on, uh, if you have a uh, an iPad, you can download it to an iPad. But oh, okay. Um, as of right now, um, kind of my my inside take on what's happening as it relates to a physical app for like an iPhone is that uh, I don't think they really have that as a focal point yet. Hopefully they may okay. at some point, but uh, but they are doing some neat things, adding some neat features. Uh, it's going to be, you know, what I really love about Canva is that they, they listen. You know, they're, they're actively trying to find out how they better, you know, how they build a better uh, tool for us. And, you know, it's the only platform out there that's really designed and structured um, in a way that serves the social space. 
you right. know, they have all the, like you said, the Facebook template sizes are there, Twitter template sizes are there, um, Instagram template sizes, you know, all the individual template sizes. You don't have to remember them. You don't have to, you know, stay on top of that. You don't have to create an independent size because all you do is click and, and design. It's awesome. Yeah, I completely agree. I think it's probably one of the best resources out there for content marketers. Absolutely. So tell us, is there uh, one book that you suggest to our listeners and, and what would it be and why? Um, well, one of the books that has been, I like I said, I'm a huge um, reader. And so it was kind of hard to, you know, pick one, just one out. But I think if I had to pick one out, it would be The Slight Edge by Jeff Olson. Uh, have you read that, Travis? No, okay. I'm going to take that note right Definitely, now. Definitely um, would encourage everyone to read this book. And the reason that I chose this one uh, over oh, oh so many others is because it basically kind of lays out just the core of how, you know, we deal with life in, uh, in a bigger picture. And then kind of ties it down to our, uh, you know, the business aspects. In other words, um, you know, when it, it, Everything, success isn't an overnight event. It's small baby steps each and every day. And it's a lot of potholes along the way, too. You know, you experience a lot of those failures. And I think the the big picture of this book is we have to think in, in a big picture way, you know, stay true to those dreams and what you're passionate about, but act in small steps, you know, uh, so that you can get to the, to the big picture goal. And uh, this book does a really, really good job of painting that picture and uh, encouraging you to realize that you, you can do amazing things just one step at a time. Well, that is what I'm going to have to pick up. It's called The Slight Edge from Jeff Olson. Is that correct? That is correct, yes. Thank you so much for sharing that yes. with us. Is there a skill that you would just love to master in the future? Oh, goodness, there's lots of them. Um, but I think, I, you know, one of the things I'd really love to do is learn another language, because right now, all I know is Southern. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to learn Spanish fluently, uh, as well as Mandarin, because I think those are two languages that as um, entrepreneurs in North America, um, mm -hmm. is going to be a continued um, strength, you know, to have to have to have the understanding or at least knowledge of the key, um, especially like the key kind of, you know, uh, like differences in culture and things like that, too, as we're doing more and more business together. Absolutely agree with you. Um, I think both of those, um, you know, you I've seen this even inside of the school system, you know, where, you know, the, the, um, the uh, school systems are kind of encouraging students to learn both of those languages over, you know, some of the more traditional, you know, in the past, like when I was coming along, French was a, a language, sure. you know, that was heavily uh, promoted. Um, but you know, nowadays, it's I think the three primary languages, again, are English. Thankfully, we speak English, <laughs> Southern yep. English, in my case. And, um, and I think, you know, uh, Spanish, as well as Mandarin are going to be huge languages in the future. Absolutely. Have you checked out Duolingo? No. Duolingo, yeah, Duolingo is a fun app for you to, a uh, free app on your iPad um, for you to learn a new language. Okay, well, I will definitely check that out. Yeah, and they're doing really cool stuff, too, with uh, transcribing, you know, uh, Internet websites and things like that, so that when we go to other, other countries' websites, it will be, you know, transcribed to our language. It's really cool. Awesome. And how do you spell that? It's D-U-O-L-I-N-G-O. I'm pretty sure that that's the spelling, Duolingo. Okay, awesome. Well, I'll check that out. Thank you. Yeah, it's really fun. It's very helpful and, and a good way to kind of learn the basics. Okay, awesome. So if you could develop any new business in the world, what would it be? Well, I'm really passionate about um, empowering uh, young entrepreneurs um, to take what they're passionate about and turn it into a profitable business. You know, I see a lot of business owners today, and not just young ones, um, but I, I think in, from the standpoint of, you know, being passionate about that uh, and, and starting a new business around that is that I, I see a lot of uh, disconnect today in the workforce. So, you know, we, you know, when I was coming along, everybody, you know, the, the deal was you, you went to school, you went to college and you got a good job. You know, that was 
the way it was. <laughs> and, mm-hmm. uh, and, and that has been passed on to our children as well. I think, you know, my, my, and I want my children to have an education and I'm, I think there's tons of value in having an education, but I think it's been oversold in some cases and, you know, and, and more specifically, it's not the education itself that's been oversold. It's the, it's the actual value of the education. So, you know, these kids are going through the process of getting an, uh, an education quote unquote that piece of paper and then they come out with without a lot of the skill sets that they actually have to have to create um, and be successful either create a business or be successful in the workforce um, you know just core things that you know just simply are not taught so I, I would love to you know catch people at an early age you know empower them with the right knowledge bases um, you know to take something that they care about and create a massive business with it I'm truly inspired by that too. And I completely agree with you about the college uh, process being so important and valuable, but it's not necessarily valuable just to have that piece of paper. Yeah. It's about what you're doing along the way. And I think one of the biggest flaws in our school system um, and the college collegiate level is that they don't teach people what happens when you have success in business, you know, like Oh, now I have to pay taxes. You know, now I got to find the right people. You know, they teach you kind of these core basics, but they don't teach you even what happens when you have success or what happens when I have failure. Yeah. What's next? Yeah. You know, and getting over that because you're going to have to get through those failures. Like you mentioned, not every idea we have is going to be a success, but it's about learning through that. And those lessons are so much more valuable than, like you mentioned, the success itself. Yeah. So, uh, can you give us one last real talk? thoughts and then also how can our listeners get a hold of you sure well i if i just you know just to share one big thing that i wish i had known when i started as an uh, an entrepreneur is um the power of the of the possible um you know i i didn't realize how possible i was when i first started and so i just like to encourage everybody to know that you know you have big possibilities in you and uh you know honor those uh and 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 be okay with them feel them and know that you know you've got great things coming your way you just have to um you know step into them and uh, you know, again, that's something I, I didn't really realize. So I'd, I'd just like to uh, sprinkle some possibility dust on everybody. <laughs> and, I love it. And then um, as it relates to how people can uh, get in touch with me, I can be found pretty much everywhere uh, on social under my name, which is Kim Garst. And my website is KimGarst.com. Um, and like I say, you can just Google me. You can find me. I'm pretty much out there. You guys have been hanging out with Kim Garst and Travis Tutal and Huff. I want to thank you for your time and keep being real. This podcast is proudly sponsored by realtimeoutsource.com. Yours.